Hey guys, another quick update. So I've temporarily made the CPU clock come from the pixel clock. Um, I'll show you how the circuit works for that in just a second. Um, I didn't really want to do this because I've been down this road before and it works well, but it's kind of limiting in some ways and can be quite fiddly to get right. But it wasn't actually too hard to get right this time. Um, so with that in place, I can now update the image without causing all the sync to get lost. And this is because now the CPU clock is arranged so that the CPU's access to the bus is happening during a time when the video circuit doesn't need to access the video RAM. Um, I think they are strictly interleaved. No, they're eight. Yeah, okay. So I've tried two different clock frequencies for this so far. One was the 1.5, 1.6 megahertz, something like that, um, which is the same as the rate at which the video circuit accesses the video memory. Um, so in that one, it was strictly interleaved one for one with the CPU accessing memory. Um, this, what you're seeing here now, is actually running at double that frequency. It's about uh, three point, what is it? It's, it's, it's like three and seven eighths of a megahertz or something like that. Um, so it allows it to refresh the screen a bit quicker. Uh, because the CPU is just running at double the, double the speed. So now the CPU is running like um, t twice, I guess, in, in the gaps between the video circuit accessing the RAM, something like that. So the new component in the circuit is just this little D flip flop, double pair of D flip flops in here. Um, that's sort of hooked up to the uh, sort of high frequency timing part of the video circuit here um, and essentially what's happening in the video circuit is that this this this, this uh, IC is a 4-bit counter and when that 4-bit count carries that's what causes the, uh, the pair of 8-bit counters here which form a 16-bit or 15-bit address for the video RAM that's what this counter carrying causes those to increment and the uh, latching over here is also triggered once per 16 tick cycle of this 4-bit counter. So I can use the various other bit outputs from that 4-bit counter to kind of create other clock phases and things like that to drive the CPU. It sounds really complicated and it kind of is to work out. I always have to draw it on paper. Um, but uh, with that done, what's happening on the D flip-flop here is the top half of it is uh, kind of calculating the CPU clock. Um, which is the same as one of the pins over here, but slightly phase shifted and inverted. And that's done by uh, sampling it based on a different pin. So when, when one of the pins here goes high, we sample the value of uh, a lower frequency pin, and that essentially just shifts the lower frequency waveform slightly. Um, the CPU clock's actually coming from the inverted output. I'm not sure whether you can see that there. Um, it's the black, the black wire is the CPU clock. Uh, the orange wire is, is the uh, control over the um, counters outputting to the video address bus and the video RAM outputting um, to the to the to the data bus there as well. Um, so those only happen when the CPU clock is low. But both of those are driven by the inverted output of that top half of this flip flop. And that's again, this is the phi two phi zero whatever you want to call it input into the CPU, which drives pretty much everything else. Other than that. Um, the little NAND gate over here is still there and it's still needed. Every single bit of it is being used for something there, but there's only one output coming from it now and it's, it's a different output to what, to, what, to what it was before, but that's what that's what controls the, uh, the uh, bus transceivers and whether they are um, allowing the CPU to access the video bus. The bottom half of the D flip-flop over here is controlling the write enable signal on the uh, video RAM. So that write enable signal, it needs to it needs to be low only when there is valid data on both the video address bus and preferably on the video data bus as well. Or that doesn't that doesn't matter quite as much. Um, the key thing though is that the transceivers are writing to that bus during the whole period of phi two being high. 
but I mustn't have the right enable go low at the start of phi 2 being high because the address won't have settled yet. I have to give it a little bit of time, a few ticks of the um, of one of these clock lines. I can't remember how, how many I've needed to put in there in the end. Um, so I have to delay the right enable going low until there's been some time for that uh, CPU address to settle on the video bus, video RAM bus there. Um, so that's what this second flip flop is for. It essentially, it's essentially sampling the state of the transceivers, um, but out of phase. So it's delaying that, and also it has to turn off the right enable signal before the transceivers stop providing data. Um, so, so, so I, I'm kind of clipping that on both sides here. In the past, when I've done this, I haven't needed to uh, turn off the right enable early. Um, it seemed fine. But I think I think in this case I do have to because as soon as I stop the transceivers right into the bus, I immediately allow the uh, counters up here to write a new address to the bus, and I think I think that shuffles things a bit too quickly for the for the RAM to cope. So yeah, the latch is doing two things there, and the the the, the first part of it is is done by using one of the clock signals up here to clock the state of the transceivers, whether they're enabled or not. Uh, and the end of the right enable is done by this blue wire, I think. No, the black wire. So the black wire here is connected to the set pin on the bottom half of the leaflet block pair. Um, and that is just driven by, um, I don't know, one of, the, one of the timing lines over here, one, whichever one made sense in, in my on paper diagram. Um, and that just makes sure that it doesn't stay the, the right enable doesn't stay enabled for very long. So yeah, um, it is kind of complex I find doing this interleaving CPU with video access, but um, it is very effective. And as you can see, um, it works well. There's no kind of artifacts, um, no loss of sync, no artifacts in the display when it uh, when it cycles like that. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and try and uh, get the CPU up to a higher frequency because it's only at 3.75 or something megahertz here. Um, I can probably get one more notch out of it before running out of RAM bandwidth on the video RAM over there. Uh, and this is without any latching as well. This is all all done still with the transceivers here. I haven't replaced them with latches, which is one of the things I was considering. Um, might still do that at some point. Again, I don't know whether I like this technique or not. I mean, it's, I've, I've used it before on on my main computer over there. Um, that's entirely based on uh, bus sharing between the CPU and GPU and having them in sync with each other. Um, again, very effective, but also kind of constricting because it means you no longer have the freedom to choose your own CPU clock speed. And it also makes the video module less of a sort of pluggable thing that you can add into any 6502 system because um, it's not quite as bad as that one over there where the CPU's main RAM was in, was the video RAM. Um, in this one the video RAM is separate, the CPU still has its own RAM over here and indeed it can access that at a faster clock rate. Uh, but it is still kind of constricting I find that the CPU is uh, dependent on the video clock to, to work at all. Um, I've still got the old 4 megahertz uh, oscillator in here that I was using before, and a few. I mean, this this is an in, this, this, oops. This is an inverter which is doing the reset and the clock, uh, or was doing the clock, um, and then this is another pair of D flip flops to divide it to two megahertz and one megahertz, so that I had a I had a choice of clock speeds there. So yeah, although this adds some complexity, I could remove some here as well if I wanted to. Um, but yeah, that's that's working pretty well. I'm pretty pleased with how it came out. Although it wasn't it wasn't a direction I particularly wanted to take this in before. Um, I'll probably play with it a little bit more, as I said, and decide whether to keep doing it like this or whether to go back to looking into making an asynchronous circuit work. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the update, and. I'll post some schematics later as well.
they ought to make a goodbye world, shouldn't they?